Chapter Nine of Folk Tales from Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask. Chapter Nine, The Emperor and the Abbot. A similar story is related of one of our English kings, John and the abbot of Canterbury. The Emperor Charlemagne was a splendid horseman, and there was nothing he enjoyed more than a long ride through field and forest. He galloped just where his fancy led him, only staying his flying steed when he wished to gaze with pride over his vast dominions. On one of these occasions he saw before him the abbey of St. Gall, and noticed with much amusement the sleek and contented air of the good abbot, who was just then strolling through the lovely gardens. His brow was smooth and open, his eyes were bright and placid as a child's, and from his well-nourished appearance it was plain that care sat lightly upon him. As the emperor surveyed him, himself unseen, he felt a pang of envy. "'My good abbot takes life too easily,' he thought. "'I must give him something to think of.' And leaving his horse with a startled servitor, he entered the gardens and greeted the abbot with kindly dignity." So pleasant was he in his inquiries as to his mode of life, the way he employed his time, and so on, that the abbot was ill-prepared for his concluding speech. "'I have three more questions to ask you,' said the emperor. "'If you can answer them correctly, you shall continue to be the abbot of St. Gall. If you fail, however, I shall command you to ride round the city on an ass, with your back towards his head, and holding his tail in your hand instead of a bridle.' The abbot turned pale and trembled and his voice shook as he inquired what his majesty's will might be. He knew, poor man, that he was far from clever, and the thought of riding upon the ass in the way described disturbed him as nothing had done in for years. The emperor, well satisfied to have ruffled his calm content, smiled to himself as he continued. "'Listen,' he cried, "'and listen well, for the peace of your future depends upon this. I will ask you my questions now, but I will give you three months in which to answer them, so that you cannot complain I have taken you unawares. The first one is, How long to a minute will it take me to go round the world? The abbot gasped, and the emperor smiled grimly as he put the second question. How much am I worth to a penny, when my crown is on my head, my scepter in my hand, and I am clad in my royal robes? He paused a moment to let the import of his words sink into the abbot's mind, then struck his final blow. Lastly, he said, you must not only tell me of what I am thinking at the moment when I next put the question, but you must prove that I am mistaken and quite in the wrong. The abbot was beyond speech now, and laughing heartily at his discomfiture, and reminding him of the ignominious penance that awaited him if he failed, the emperor mounted his horse and rode away. Gone was the good abbot's peace of mind. Night and day he was haunted by those terrible questions. He could not sleep, and he could not eat. His plight, indeed, was pitiable. In vain he consulted the learned men throughout the emperor's dominions. The wisest professors in the great university shook their heads when the questions were put to them, and the answers they gave were so unsatisfactory that even the abbot could see they would not do. A month flew by as if its flight were winged. A second followed it swiftly, and when the third drew to its close the abbot was in despair. None of his friends could comfort him, and, sad at heart, he wandered over the country, envying the humblest creature that made its home in the fields. He was in this mood when he was suddenly accosted by a shepherd, to whom he was well known by sight. "'Good morning, Lord Abbot,' said the man. "'You seem distressed. I would gladly serve you if I could, for many a sup of good red wine did you send my wife when she was ill and food for the children when times were hard. Tell me, I pray you, what troubles you so sorely? A mouse before now has been known to help a lion. The abbot was touched by the poor man's sympathy, which he accepted as simply as it was offered. Be thankful, he said, that you are only a shepherd, for many are the ills that your precision spares you. And laying aside his usual reserve with his inferiors, he told him of the penance he must perform if he failed to answer the emperor's terrible questions. The time that his majesty gave me has nearly expired, he added mournfully, and I am no nearer to solving them than I was at first. Too dispirited to try and hide the tears that filled his eyes, the abbot sadly resumed his walk. 
The shepherd laid a detaining hand on his flowing mantle. "'My lord,' he said, "'I am only a humble shepherd, but I believe I can answer those questions for you. If you will lend me your cloak, your mitre, and your cross, I will appear before the emperor in your place, and you will be spared this trial.' The abbot shook his head at this suggestion, but after a moment or two it did not appear to him so wild as it had done at first. Strange to relate, the shepherd was much the same build as himself, and had the rosy cheeks and unwrinkled brow that had been his own before the emperor's visit. His eyes also were similar in colour to the good abbot's, and when he spoke gently, as he did now, his voice was not too rough. "'You are a good fellow,' said the abbot gratefully, and suddenly realising that if the shepherd took his place before the emperor— he would likewise have to carry out the prescribed penance if he failed to answer the questions. After a little more urging on the poor man's part, he consented to his request. It was a forlorn hope, but a drowning man catches at a straw, and the abbot's dreams were still haunted by a giant ass which had the head of the emperor and a thousand tongues. When the last day of the three months' grace had expired, his majesty, who had by this time forgotten the whole occurrence, was told that the abbot of St. Gall awaited his royal pleasure. Laughing maliciously, he contemplated for some moments the man whom he believed to be the victim of his ingenious questions, noting with satisfaction that his figure appeared less bulky than before. Oh, he cried, it strikes me, Lord Abbot, that you are somewhat thinner than you used to be, less sleek of hair, too, and your face is oval instead of round. Have you found the answers to my questions? If not, remember, you must pay the penalty. To his amazement, the Abbot looked him bravely in the face instead of cringing. I quite understand, Your Majesty, he replied, and am prepared to carry out your conditions. Well, then, said the Emperor, rather taken aback, tell me, in the first place, the exact time, to the very minute, in which I could go round the world on horseback. Do not hurry. I want an accurate reply. If Your Majesty will set out the instant the sun flames his banners above the horizon, and travel as quickly round the world as he does, you will have completed the tour in just twenty-four hours. This answer so amazed the emperor that he remained silent for a while. As he could find no fault with it, he passed on to the second question. Well, then, how much am I worth, to the very penny, when clad in my royal robes, with my crown on my head and my scepter in my hand? Without showing the least sign of fear or hesitation, the pretended abbot still looked him steadily in the face and reverently lowered his voice. The saviour of the world, he said, was sold for thirty pieces of silver— and since your majesty would not claim to be so great as he, I therefore estimate your value at one piece less. The answer did not please the emperor, but he could not openly find fault with it. Well, he said haughtily, you have certainly answered two of my questions, but the third is yet to come, and if you fail with this, you must still ride through the city on an ass. Tell me what I think at this present moment. You think that I am the abbot of St. Gall, was the quick reply. I do, returned the emperor, and I am curious to know how you are going to prove that I am wrong. The shepherd took off his cloak and mitre, displaying his peasant's garb. Then I am not, he said with emphasis, as you may see. The contrast between the abbot's robes and the shepherd's raiment so tickled the emperor's fancy that he burst out laughing. You are a daring fellow, he exclaimed, and a witty one also. Since you have afforded me so much amusement, I will give you any reward that you may ask even to making you the abbot of St. Gall in the place of your master. "'As your majesty has so graciously promised to give me what I ask,' returned the honest shepherd, "'let my good master remain the abbot for the rest of his life, without further anxiety.' "'Would that my courtiers were as true to me as you are to him,' replied the emperor, greatly struck by this poor man's loyalty and devotion. He did as he wished, and promised that the abbot should be left in peace for the rest of his life, but he made it a condition that the shepherd himself should be well paid— so that in the future he and his children need fear neither cold nor hunger. To do him justice, the abbot was in no danger of forgetting his services, and as a further token of gratitude for his timely help, no one in need was ever allowed to leave the abbey in want or misery. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Folk Tales from Many Lands》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
org. Recording by Kalinda. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask. Chapter Ten, Yvonne and Finette, a Breton folk story. Amongst the ancient nobles of Brittany was a baron so brave and good that no one had aught to say against him. It seemed indeed as if he were a favorite of fortune, for his six tall sons were well built and handsome, his six fair daughters the loveliest in the land, and his wife as sweet as she was beautiful. When a thirteenth child was born to them, the good baron declared that they could scarcely find room for another baby, so numerous was his family but the little fellow soon became as dear to him as the rest. They called him Yvon, and as he grew up he was beloved by all for his courage and good temper. From his earliest childhood nothing could daunt him, and when he was one and twenty he longed to go out and fight the world. Approaching his father he explained his wish to him. "'Let me seek my fortune,' he cried. There are so many at the castle that there is really no place for me, and I have nothing to do. The world is wide, and I would prove my courage. Dear father, let me go. The baron demurred at first, but in the end he agreed, and Yvon, bidding them all farewell, set off in excellent spirits. The motto of the Curver family, forward, rang in his ears, and he sang to himself as he stepped out blithely. On reaching the coast he found a vessel ready to sail, and gladly embarked. What hopes were his as the great sails filled the wind and bore the vessel high over the crested waves? When the storm blew up and the sky grew dark, he began to think his adventures had begun, and as the great ship struck upon a rock and word went round that she was sinking, he was still undismayed. Forgetful of his own safety, he gave up his place in the boats, first to one and then to another, and in the midst of that panic-stricken crew, he alone was calm and collected. It was well for him that he stayed on deck, for the boats were scarcely launched when they were overturned by the raging sea. Yvon alone, out of all that crew, was able to fight his way to shore, and as he battled with the waves the family watchword, FORWARD, rang in his ears and mingled with the storm. When at last he reached the land he was all but exhausted, but after having rested a while on the wreck-strewn beach, he climbed the nearest hill. The sullen waters stretched on every side, so he knew he was on an island. From his post of vantage he saw a great house standing alone, and hastening towards this, he found it even larger than it had first appeared to him. The doors and windows were fully sixty feet in height, and when he gained the entrance he found it quite impossible to touch the knocker of the huge door. Undaunted by this, he picked up a stone and hammered loudly on the panels. His summons was quickly answered. A giant, so tall that his head towered above Yvon, like that of some mighty forest tree, glared at him angrily from the threshold. "'Who are you?' he thundered in a voice that shook the walls. "'Who are you, and what do you want?' "'I am Yvon, son of the Baron Curver in Brittany, and I am come to seek my fortune,' replied the youth." "'Good!' cried the giant. "'Then your fortune is made. I am seeking a servant, and you can have the place. If you serve me well, I will pay you well. But if you do not do exactly what I tell you, I will eat you.' "'Agreed,' said Yvon cheerfully, wringing the water from his coat and making to step inside. But the giant moved farther forward and barred his way. "'I shall be busy to-day,' he said in a curious voice for I am taking my flocks to the mountains. During my absence you must clean out the stables thoroughly, and whatever you do, don't attempt to enter my house. Mind this on pain of my displeasure. And with a threatening scowl he drew the door close to, and strode away. Yvon looked after him reflectively. There must be something very interesting in the house, he said, or my new master would not have forbidden me to enter. Finding the door unlatched, he strolled leisurely through the hall and into the first room. This was completely empty, with the exception of a large iron pot hung over the grate. Peering inside it, Yvonne discovered a strange thick fluid that appeared to be bubbling with heat, although there was no sign of any fire. 
I wonder what it tastes like, he thought, but prudently decided to get some idea of what it was before he tried it. He cut off a lock of his hair and dipped it into the seething mass. On drawing it out again, he found to his surprise that the dusky lock was coated over with copper. "'Dear me!' he cried. "'The giant must have a very strong digestion to be able to eat this. I hope he won't give any of it to me.' More curious than ever, he entered a second chamber, where everything was just the same as in the first. There was no furniture of any kind, only a great iron pot in the fireless grate. On dipping a lock of hair into the midst of this, he found it coated with silver. "'This new master of mine must be rich indeed,' he thought, to feast on silver soup. I should not care to drink it myself, but every one to his taste. The third room he entered was no different from the others, but here the big iron pot contained a yellow liquid that gleamed like gold. Yvon was greatly impressed by the giant's wealth, and without any scruple entered the fourth room. As he did so, a lovely girl ran hastily towards him, exclaiming, "'Who are you, sir, and what are you doing here? Unhappy youth! You know not the dangers round you. If the giant should find you, he would kill you at once. Hasten away, I pray you.' "'I am Yvon, the son of Baron Curver,' he replied. "'I am seeking my fortune, and am not at all afraid of the giant.' He has engaged me to be his servant. While he spoke, Yvon was gazing at the girl's fair face, and admiring the exquisite violet of her eyes. As these met his, she blushed divinely, and her eyelids drooped over them like snow-white satin curtains. "'What has he given you to do?' she faltered. When Yvon told her, her cheeks lost all their delicate colour. "'To sweep out a stable sounds an easy task,' she said, "'but you would not find it so.' The giant's stable is a magic one, and he has laid it under a spell. When you sweep the dust through the door, it flies back through the window, but if you use the handle of the broom instead of the other end, the stable will empty itself, and not a speck of dust will remain. I am glad to hear that, said Yvon contentedly, and when I set to work I will do as you say. But now, since I have found you, let us talk together. I want to hear everything you have to tell me, and why you were living in the giant's house." The fair young girl allowed him to lead her to a seat in the deep window, and her voice was like sweetest music as she told him how she had become a captive of the giant. Her name was Finette, she added, and Yvon thought it the prettiest in the world. He, in his turn, told her where he came from and all he could remember of his past life, and they were too much engrossed in each other to notice that the shadows were lengthening in the west. It was not until the twilight spread her purple haze that Yvon thought of the hour, "'Make haste, my friend, and sweep the stable, or the giant will be here first. cried Finette anxiously, and with one more look into her violet eyes, Yvon obeyed her. He was thinking so much of her gentle ways that he did not at first remember her instructions, and the dust flew round him in such clouds that he was almost stifled. He immediately reversed the broom, and at once it happened as she had said. The stable swept itself without any further trouble on his part, and folding his arms, he sat down on a bench outside to await his master's return. The giant looked anything but pleasant when he caught sight of the young man. "'Why are you sitting there, you lazy scoundrel?' he shouted angrily. "'Because I have nothing to do,' was Yvon's cool reply. "'What?' cried the giant. "'I told you to sweep out the stable.' "'It is done,' replied Yvon, and away went the giant to see if this were true. He came back angrier than before. "'You rascal!' he exclaimed. "'You never did that unaided. "'You have seen my finette!' Yvon met this accusation with affected stupidity. "'Mi finette?' he cried. "'What is that, good master? "'Is it an animal, a thing, or a person? "'Show it to me, I beg you.' "'Idiot!' roared the giant, gnashing his teeth. "'Be gone to the barn, where you must sleep on the ground. "'Tomorrow I will set you another task, "'and then you will see that I am not to be trifled with.' Yvon woke next morning at break of day, and while his eyes were yet heavy with sleep he heard the giant's voice calling him. Stepping outside the barn, Yvon gave him a civil good morning. This was met by an angry stare. "'Be off to the mountain,' said the giant in a very masterful fashion. "'My black horse is grazing on the topmost height. You must catch him at once and bring him back to the stable, or I shall put an end to your useless life.' 
Don't dare to go into my house while I am absent. Scowling at Yvon, as if he hated the sight of him, he strode away in his seven-league boots at a great pace. He was hardly out of sight before the adventurous youth, caring nothing for his injunctions, made his way to the forbidden door. He was already deeply in love with the fair Finette, and counted each moment an hour until he could see her. She greeted him tenderly with the softest look in her violet eyes, and a blush that reminded him of the rosy clouds at dawn. "'What task has he set you to-day?' she inquired timidly, drooping before him like some sweet flower. "'Nothing to trouble me,' the youth replied. "'Only to find his horse. That will be easy enough, and I shall enjoy climbing the mountain.' "'You would not find it so easy if I were not here to tell you what to do,' said Finette shudderingly. "'That horse of his is a monster, and the fire from his nostrils would burn you up if you approached him rashly.' "'Then I shall stay here instead of climbing the mountain,' declared her lover. "'I don't mean to die now that I have found you.' Finette laughed joyously, and crept a little closer within the circle of his arm. "'If you take the magic bridle you will find behind the stable door,' she murmured, "'you will be quite safe.' for at the sight of this he becomes as gentle and docile as a lamb. "'That is well,' said Yvon. "'I will fetch him presently.' And making his way with Finette to a leafy grove, he passed the time in pleasant converse. They had so much to say to each other that the afternoon had almost flown when he once more bethought him of his second task. "'Take the bridle and go,' said pretty Finette, and with a light heart he started to climb the mountainside. He had not gone far when a monstrous animal galloped wildly towards him, snorting like thunder and throwing out fire and smoke from his open nostrils. Not in the least alarmed, Yvon awaited him in the centre of the path, gently shaking the magic bridle. At the sight of this the horse stopped short and, kneeling down meekly, allowed Yvon to mount and so to ride him home. When the horse was safely shut in the giant's stable, the young man took his seat upon the bench, and, whistling softly a merry tune, closed his eyes to think of Finette. Thus his master found him soon afterwards. "'You lazy creature!' he exclaimed. "'Why have you not done what I told you? Where is my horse?' "'In your stable, good master,' was the unexpected reply. "'He's a nice animal. I should not mind owning him myself.' "'My horse a nice animal?' thundered the giant. "'You must be mad!' and he hurried off to the stable to see if Yvon had really succeeded in carrying out his orders. There stood the great horse, looking cowed and frightened, while the magic bridle hung in its usual place behind the door. "'You wretch!' cried the giant, as he went back. "'My Finette must have helped you again.' "'Mi Finette? What's that?' inquired Yvon, with the air of stupidity that he had worn the day before. "'You will know soon enough.' growled his master, going off to bed. As Yvon slept on his own hard couch, he dreamt of the day when his fortune would be made, and he could make Finette his wife. It was still quite early when the giant aroused him by calling his name. "'Go to my mountain cavern,' he commanded, "'and bring me a sack of my buried treasure.' "'Very well, good master,' Yvon replied, without betraying the slightest astonishment, and he pretended to sweep the stable until the giant had gone off for the day." He then hastened to Finette, who was waiting for him just inside the door, anxious to know what task the giant had set him now. "'Where is this mountain cavern, and how can I reach it?' Yvon inquired. "'Can you help me again? I confess I am at a loss as to how to find it.' "'You must take this wand,' said Finette, handing him the little switch of hazel she had been hiding behind her apron, "'and strike it three times against that huge black rock you see half up the mountain.' A hideous goblin will at once appear and ask you roughly what you want. My master's treasure, you will reply. How much, he will ask you next. Not more than I can carry, will be your answer. He will then lead you into a deep grotto with walls of gold where there are lustrous gems strewn all about. Fill your sack with these and be careful not to speak. When you have taken as much as you can carry away comfortably, pass out in silence and hasten back to me. I will do exactly as you tell me, dear Finette, Yvonne assured her. They talked together until the sun told them it was midday. Then he bade her a tender farewell and set off again for the mountains. 
When he came to the black rock, everything happened as he had been told, and he followed the goblin into a cavern stacked with the most brilliant rubies and pearls and emeralds that he had ever seen. Stifling his exclamation of wonder, Yvon filled his sack as calmly as if they were only dried peas, and followed his strange guide back to the open air. It did not please him to be impolite, but remembering Finette's warning, he refrained from bidding his goblin guide farewell. He had scarcely reached the giant's house when his master reappeared. "'Have you carried out my command?' he asked in tones that would have made a man less brave than Yvon tremble. For answer the youth opened the sack and displayed the shining treasure that it contained. Instead of thanking him for his services, the giant became convulsed with rage. "'This is the work of my finette!' he roared, and for the third time Yvon feigned ignorance of his meaning and anxiously inquired what Miffinette might be. The giant did not sleep that night, but paced his room as if in deep perplexity. In her cheerless chamber below, poor little Finette heard the thud of his footsteps, and wondered what fresh harm he was planning against her lover. When morning came, he rode away without setting Yvon another task, and this, she felt, was a bad sign. "'Go and sit on the bench,' she entreated, as Yvon hastened to her when the giant had gone. So he sat in the sunshine and whistled merrily until the giant returned. Directing upon him a look of the direst hatred, the ferocious monster told Finette to fetch a knife. "'You must kill that youth,' he said, "'for I want some soup. He is good for this, if nothing else. I will take a nap while you prepare it. See that you flavor him properly, and put it in plenty of salt.' Very soon his deep breathing told Finette he was asleep and she flew back to Yvon with a knife in her hand. "'You are not going to kill me, sweetheart, surely,' he said, as he glanced at its gleaming blade. Finette's laugh was her only answer, and putting her golden head very close to his dark one, she whispered in his ear. "'Hold out your hand,' she said. Yvon did so smilingly, and with a deft stroke of the sharp knife she cut his finger, so slightly, however, that only three drops of blood fell on the stone-paved yard." "'Now come with me,' she cried, and led him into the house. Filling one of the big iron cauldrons half full of water, she placed this over the fire which she and Yvonne had lit between them, and flying back to the garden threw a heap of onions and other vegetables into a deep bag. Returning with these, she poured them into the cauldron, adding a measure of pepper and two of salt. She then entreated Yvonne to throw in also his cap, his jacket, and his leather gaiters. When this had been done, she left the cauldron and its contents, and entered the third chamber that led from the hall. From the golden soup in the iron pot there she made three gold bullets, and slipped these into her pocket. In the second chamber she made two silver bullets from the silver soup, and in the first a large bullet of copper. "'Now let us escape,' she cried, before the giant awakes. And hand in hand they flew down the road as fast as their feet could carry him. Presently the giant awoke. Finette, he cried, "'Is that soup ready?' "'Not yet, dear master,' replied the first drop of blood, and the giant turned over and went to sleep again. When next he woke and called, Finette, the second drop of blood answered his question about the soup in the same manner, and when he demanded it for the third time, the third drop cried, "'Not yet!' A little while later he awoke again, and this time there was no response. So, grumbling and threatening, he slouched to the kitchen, where the cauldron was bubbling merrily. A savory smell greeted him as he entered, but his suspicions were aroused by Finette's absence. He seized a huge fork and stirred the soup vigorously, fishing out Yvon's boots and coat and even his cap. These did not deceive him, however, as Finette had vainly imagined they would. With a howl of rage, he quickly drew on his seven-league boots and started in pursuit of the fugitives. So swiftly did he travel in their wake that before long Yvon and Finette heard his panting breath. With much presence of mind, the maiden threw the copper bullet behind her, exclaiming, "'Save us, bullet!' The ground immediately opened, and a huge chasm now separated them from their pursuer. The enraged giant tore up a great tree as if it had been a sapling, and throwing it over the chasm, thus made a bridge by means of which he crossed the gap, and again overtook Finette and Yvon just as they reached the coast. Finette now threw a silver bullet into the sea, 
and at this a ship immediately appeared, in which she and Yvon took instant refuge. As it bore them onward over the swelling waves, the great giant waded after them. He had all but reached the ship when Finette threw her second silver bullet into the sea. Suddenly a monstrous fish appeared from the depths below, and rushed through the water with open mouth. The giant, like most bullies, was a coward at heart, and shaking with fear he retreated to land as quickly as he could. "'We are safe now, dearest,' cried Yvon joyfully, when he saw the, his huge black form scuffling away in the distance, but Finette trembled still. "'I am not so sure,' she told him doubtfully. "'The giant has a dreadful aunt on the other shore, who will be just as eager to harm us when she hears we have escaped. We shall not be safe until we reach your father's castle.' The rest of their voyage passed uneventfully, and it seemed as if the young couple had come to an end of their troubles. Finette had grown more beautiful every day, but when they had almost arrived at Yvon's home, the young man looked at her critically for the first time. "'You are indeed most lovely,' he told her ardently, "'and as sweet and charming as man could wish. But it would never do for you to enter my father's castle on foot and in such plain and homely attire.' I will leave you here while I fetch you a rich robe befitting the station you are to occupy, and the finest carriage in our stables shall bear you to my home. Finette demurred at this with many tears. She feared to be left alone, she said, and entreated her lover to take her with him. But although she looked more beautiful than ever, Yvon refused. It is your turn now to trust me, even as I trusted you, he said. You must believe my word when I tell you that I will soon return. "'Before you go, then,' begged poor Finette, "'promise me that you will neither eat nor drink "'until we are once more together.' "'Yvon promised this with fond caresses, "'and Finette was forced to let him go. "'The sound of music greeted him "'as he entered the castle by a secret passage, "'not liking to be seen in his present plight "'by the gaily dressed throng that filled the courtyard. "'The marriage of his eldest sister was then being celebrated, and though Yvon loved his sister dearly, and would have liked nothing better than to take part in the ceremony, he would not delay a moment, even to wish her joy. He made a confidant of the old woman who had nursed him in his childhood, and soon obtained from her an exquisite satin robe embroidered with pearls and diamonds that belonged to one of her fair charges, and with this in his knapsack he made his way to the castle gates. As he was passing through them, a golden-haired lady offered him a cup of rich red wine. "'You will not refuse to drink my health,' she cried, as he put it aside, and rather than appear ungallant, he raised it to his lips and drank. Alas, it was magic wine, the wine of forgetfulness, and as he drained the jeweled cup all thoughts of Finette passed out of his mind. The golden-haired lady was the giant's aunt, and this was just what she had schemed. Looking dazed and miserable, he raised his hand to his aching head, but she led him back into the castle and soothed him with gentle speech. When she saw him among the guests, the old nurse thought he had been but joking when he asked her for the dress, which was tossed aside and soon forgotten. For the first few hours after her lover's departure, Finette awaited his return in the happy confidence inspired by his parting words. "'He will surely come soon,' she said, as the shadows lengthened, but when the primrose lights faded into a deep violet, and the light of the evening stars shone clear in a sombre sky, her fears came back to her. "'He has forgotten me,' she sighed, and sorely perplexed as to what would now be her fate, she wandered on until she came to a little hut, where a peasant woman sat before the door milking a sleek grey cow. "'Will you give me a drink, good dame?' asked Finette faintly, for she was sick with hunger and disappointment. "'Willingly,' replied the woman, "'if you will give me a cup of gold.' Finette felt in her pockets for one of the golden bullets, and dropped this into the vessel the woman laughingly held out to her. Immediately it filled itself with bright gold coins, which jingled together musically as she poured them into the woman's lap. "'I am rich! I am rich!' cried the dame in ecstasy. "'I will leave you my hut and all that it contains, for I am off to the city where I shall be a fine lady and live like a queen for the rest of my days.' Without waiting even to stall her cow, she ran through the gate of the tiny garden and was lost to sight in the dusk. The hut was dirty and meanly furnished, and the only food in the cupboard was a dry piece of cheese and a loaf of black bread. Finette was almost too weary to care what became of her, but she had just sufficient energy to take another golden bullet from her pocket and to murmur, "'Help me, bullet,' as she threw it down. 
the mean little hovel instantly became a fair and spacious mansion, with staircase and furniture of purest gold and beds and curtains of softest silk. Throwing herself down upon the first couch she came to, Finette soon fell asleep. Meanwhile the delighted peasant woman met the mayor of the town, and proudly displayed her newly acquired wealth, explaining how she had come by it. The mayor advised her to keep this to herself in the future, since otherwise folk might doubt her word. He said this, however, not from consideration for her interests, but because he had instantly resolved to ask this wonderful girl to wed him, before any one else should learn of her fairy powers. Next morning he dressed himself in his best, and rode to the beautiful mansion where the mean little hovel had once stood. Finette received him without emotion, and listened quietly as he asked her to be his wife. "'How do I know,' she said, "'that you would make me a good husband? Let me see the way in which you would set light to a fire.' With this object in view he took up the tongs, thinking unkindly that once she was his wife he would soon teach her who was master. "'Hold him, tongs!' cried Finette quickly, "'and do not let him go until after sunset.' As she uttered these words she left the house, and the iron tongs began to dance, still holding the indignant mayor in an iron grasp. He was thus obliged to dance also, and as the tongs did not stop until nightfall, he was so exhausted when they set him free that he could only creep home and go to bed. Of course the peasant woman had failed to keep her counsel, and by this time everyone in the town knew the secret of her riches. A penniless young officer who had already run through a large fortune thought that to obtain the hand of this strange young girl in marriage would be an excellent way in which to replenish his empty coffers. So he too dressed himself in his best, and donning his handsomest uniform, proceeded to call on Finette, who had now returned to her fairy house. The maiden listened to his proposal as gravely as she had done to that of the mayor, and hesitated for some moments before attempting to reply. This so enraged the impatient soldier that he forgot himself as an officer and a gentleman, and actually threatened her with his sword. Finette fled in dismay, for even in her service with the giant she had not received such rough treatment. Brushing by the sleek grey cow she took refuge in the stable, and the officer, hastening after her, caught hold of the animal's tail to push it out of the way. Seeing this, Finette exclaimed, "'Hold him, tail, until the sun sets!' Deeply angered at the liberty that the officer had taken with her, the cow galloped off at the top of her speed. She raced over hill and dale, over rocky pathways and beds of bramble, so that by the time that dusk had arrived, and her tail let him go, the rude young man was almost dead with fatigue. The knowledge of the discomfiture of her greedy suitors did not comfort Finette. She guessed by now that Yvon had forgotten her and could she have seen what was going on at the castle, she would have known that her worst fears were realized. Oblivious as he was of all that had happened on the giant's island, and unconscious of his dear Finette's very existence, he had fallen a victim to the charms of the golden-haired lady, little dreaming that her lovely form was but a disguise she had assumed to snare him. In a very short time he had pledged his faith to her, and a second marriage was announced to take place in the baron's family. The wedding garments of the bride were a sight to behold, and the sprightliest horses in the castle stables were harnessed to the gilded coach that was to bear her to church with Yvon. As they rode on, a strange sadness overcame him. He could not tell why, but his brain was troubled by waking dreams, and he was haunted by the recollection of a pair of violet eyes that were very unlike those of his bride-elect. When they neared Finette's house, the horses pranced and curveted until one of the traces broke, and this took some time to mend. A few paces farther this happened again, and so on continually, until it seemed as if the harness would drop to pieces. At this juncture the mayor came forward. "'In that house yonder,' he said, bowing respectfully to the bride, "'there lives a lady who owns a pair of tongs that would hold together anything in this mortal world. If you send a message by one of your servants she will doubtless lend them willingly.' A messenger was soon dispatched to Finette's house, and returned shortly, bearing the tongs in question. But now a new difficulty presented itself. No sooner had the harness been successfully patched up than the carriage itself obstinately refused to stir. The splendid horses pulled with might and main, but it remained stationary, and as time was getting short the bride became very angry. Yvon was marvelling at the change this made in her appearance, 
when the handsome officer approached the carriage. "'If you will pardon the suggestion,' he said, "'I would advise you to apply for the loan of her cow to the lady who lent you the tongs. If the tail of that creature were switched on to the coach, your difficulties would be over. It could make anything go.' The unknown lady proved to be as obliging as before, and soon the cow was pulling the carriage along at a furious pace. It arrived at the church in a few moments, but instead of stopping at the door and allowing the wedding party to alight, it continued to race round and round the sacred building as if it were urged by evil spirits, and then turned back to the baron's castle, before the entrance of which it came to a dead stop. It was then much too late to think of returning to the church that day, and the baron, wishing to lighten his guest's disappointment, decreed that the banquet should proceed as if the wedding had taken place. Before they sat down, however, he determined to invite the unknown lady who had so kindly lent Yvon her tongs and her cow. "'It is the least that we can do,' agreed his son, and a messenger was dispatched with a formal missive sealed with the baron's grandest seal. In a short time he returned, but without the lady. "'What did she say?' inquired the baron, anxious that his guest should be kept waiting no longer. "'She said, sire,' returned the man, "'that if the baron desired her company, he must come and fetch her himself.' "'She is right,' exclaimed the baron. "'It was most remiss of me not to have thought of this before.' So saying, he bade his guests amuse themselves with dancing until his return, and drove forthwith to Finette's house. Having thanked her with all the grace that he could muster for her services to his son, he handed her into the gilt coach, and she was thus escorted to the castle as if she had been some royal princess. Not only this, but when she arrived at the banqueting hall, she was given the post of honour beside her host. A thrill ran through the company as they remarked her beauty and the splendour of her attire, for her dress was of violet velvet, the same deep hue as her eyes, and so encrusted with gems that it flashed with her every movement. She was the centre of attraction to all but Yvon, who had eyes for no one save the golden-haired lady by his side. Finette watched him with a heart full of anguish, feeling in the bosom of her rich gown for the single golden bullet that remained to her. As she pressed it between her slender fingers she gazed steadily at Yvon. He was whispering now to his lady-love, and Finette could have cried aloud in her pain. "'Help me, bullet,' she murmured, and the golden ball became a golden cup filled to the brim with wine the colour of rubies. "'Will you not drink my health, sir?' she cried to Yvon, who assented with a start. She passed him over the golden cup, and her face was white as a snowdrop. In spite of the detaining hand that the golden-haired lady laid on his arm, he quaffed it to its dregs. The next moment he started to his feet, and stared round him in wild amazement. "'Where am I?' he asked, "'and how do I come here?' "'Oh, my sweet Finette, so I have found you again!' And hastening round to her side, he embraced her fondly. Once more he remembered everything that had happened since he left his father's house to seek his fortune, and it was well for the golden-haired lady that she had made her escape before he had time to reckon with her. "'Can you ever forgive me, sweet?' he asked Finette when he had received his parents' congratulations, and his brothers were envying him so lovely a bride. Finette smiled happily. She knew that but for the giant's spell she would not have been forgotten, and her great joy made her lovelier than ever. Yvon and she were married the following day, and this time, we may be sure, there was no hitch in the proceedings. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Folk Tales from Many Lands This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask Chapter Eleven Prince Ivan and the Grey Wolf A Russian Folk Story in a far-off land surrounded by snow-capped mountains, and watered by rivers that flowed swiftly down to the sea, dwelt a mighty Tsar. His people loved as well as feared him, for the glance of his eagle eye was very kind, and he was ever ready to listen to their pleas for help or justice. When he rode abroad on the great white horse that was shod with gold, they flocked to bless him, 
and throughout the whole of his wide dominion there was not one discontented man, woman, or child. He had no foes to trouble him, since rival monarchs knew full well that their troops would be dispersed like mist in sunlight before the charge of his victorious army. And his three sons, Dmitri, Vasily, and Ivan, were all that a father could desire. Yet the good Tsar's brow was clouded as he walked in his garden, and from time to time he uttered a deep sigh. This garden was his greatest pride. In days gone by the forests had been rifled of their most splendid trees, that they might spread their shade over the rare and lovely flowers that travellers brought him from every part of the globe. The perfume of his million rose trees was carried on the wind for fifty miles beyond the palace and so wonderful were their colors that the eyes of those who beheld them were dazzled by so much brilliance. There were the gorgeous orchids, which, in order that the garden of their beloved Tsar might be the most beautiful in the world, men had risked their lives to obtain, and every imaginable kind of fruit hung in tempting clusters from the drooping boughs of the trees. To look at them was to make one's mouth water, and the sick folk in his kingdom shared with the Tsar the pleasures of taste and touch. The tree that gave him most pleasure bore nothing but golden apples. When spring came round and tender buds appeared upon the whispering branches, the Tsar caused a net of fine white seed pearls to be spread around it, so that the sweet-voiced choristers who filled his groves with music should not come near them. They might feast at will on every other in his garden, he said, but the golden apples they must leave for him and as if in gratitude for his many kindnesses, even when the net of pearls was taken away, and the apples gleamed like fairy gold amidst the emerald green of their shapely leaves, not one of the birds approached them. When cares of state pressed heavily upon him, the Tsar sought rest beneath the loaded branches and forgot his troubles in watching the sunlight play on the golden balls. Now all was changed and the Tsar's deep sigh betokened feelings of deep annoyance. Morning after morning he found the apple tree stripped of its golden treasures and its emerald leaves strewn on the ground. This was the work of the magic bird, who once upon a time had lived in the great cloud castles that gather in the west, but was now the slave of a distant king. The feathers of the magic bird were as radiant as the sun-god's plumes, and her eyes as clear as crystal. When she had wrought her will on the apple trees, she would fly blithely home to the garden of her own master, and try as they would, not one of the Tsar's head gardeners could even catch sight of her. The good Tsar meditated much upon the matter, and one windy morning in autumn he called his three sons to him. "'My children,' he said, "'the source of my grief is known to you, and I now entreat your help. Will you each in turn forego your sleep?' that you may watch in my garden for the magic bird? To him who shall capture her I will give the half of my kingdom, and when I am called thence he shall reign in my stead. Willingly, O oh my father, answered each of his three sons, and Prince Dmitri, as the eldest, claimed the right to the first watch. The garden was flooded with moonlight, as the prince threw himself down on a moss-grown bank that faced the tree and the fragrance of the roses soon worked its drowsy spell. From a grove of myrtles came the song of a sweet-voiced nightingale. Gluck, 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 she trilled, and in listening to her the prince fell fast asleep. When he awoke it was light again. The tree had been once more despoiled, and the magic bird had flown. The same thing occurred when Prince Vasily took his turn in watching. It is only fair to him to say that he did not fall asleep until the night was far spent, but as the east began to quiver with light, he too became overpowered with slumber. The magic bird was watching her opportunity, and yet again she robbed the tree. When questioned by the Tsar, both princes solemnly assured him that no strange bird had visited the garden during the night, but though he fain would have believed them, he could not doubt the evidence of his eyes. It was now Prince Ivan's turn to watch. He was not nearly so good-looking as his brothers, but he had a stout heart and a cool head, and he made up his mind to keep awake at any cost. Instead of reclining on the ground, 
he perched himself in the boughs of the tree. And when the song of the nightingale threatened to lull him to sleep as it had done the elder princes, he put his fingers into his ears that he might not hear it. An hour passed slowly, a second, and then a third. Suddenly the whole garden was lit up as if with a burst of sunshine, and with rays of light flashing from every shaft of her golden feathers the magic bird flew down and began to peck at the shining apples. Prince Ivan, scarcely daring to breathe, stretched out his hand and caught as much of her tail as he could grasp. With a startled cry the magic bird spread her beautiful wings and wrenched herself free, leaving behind one glittering feather, which the prince held firmly. At break of day he took this to his father, humbly apologizing for his ill success in not having caught the magic bird herself. "'Nevertheless you have done well, my son,' said the Tsar gratefully, and he placed the feather, which shone so brightly that at dusk it illuminated the whole room, in a cabinet of cedar and mother-of-pearl. The magic bird came no more to the palace garden, and the precious tree was never again despoiled of its golden apples. But the Tsar was not content. He sighed to possess the bird that had robbed him, and once more he summoned his three sons. "'My children,' he said, "'I am sick with longing for the magic bird. Seek her, I pray you, and bring her to me. What I have promised already then shall be yours. The princes assented gladly, each anxious to find the magic bird. Prince Ivan alone wished to please his father. His brothers were only thinking of the riches and honors they would gain for themselves. So dear was this youngest son to the monarch's heart that he was loath to part with him when the time came, but the youth insisted. "'It will not be for long, dear father,' he cried. I shall soon return with the magic bird you sigh for. So the Tsar blessed him and let him go. Prince Ivan took the fleetest horse in the imperial stables and rode on and on for many days. At last he came to a bare field set in the midst of a fair green meadow, and in the center of this stood a block of rough gray stone. Inscribed upon the stone in crimson letters was a strange verse. Hungry and cold shall that man be who rides in pride straight up to me. To ride from the left means death and sorrow, though his horse shall live for many a morrow. He who rides from the right shall have good things all, but ere three days pass his horse shall fall. Prince Ivan was greatly troubled at the thought of losing his horse, but to ride from the right seemed the wisest course for him to pursue. Accordingly he did so and so swift was his horse's flight that he had soon left the grey stone far behind. On the third day, as he was passing the borders of a gloomy forest, a big grey wolf sprang out from a thicket, and flying at his horse's throat, threw him on the ground and killed him, in spite of Ivan's gallant attempt to beat him off. Ivan would now have run the grey wolf through with the jeweled dagger his father had given him as a parting present but before he could rise from the spot where he had been thrown, the creature spoke. "'Spare me, wise prince,' he entreated humbly. "'I have but done as I was commanded. My death will not give you back your horse, while if you spare my life I will be your friend forever and will carry you over the world.' Prince Ivan saw that he would gain nothing by being revengeful and mindful of his quest, accepted the wolf's offer to be his steed. "'Tell me where you wish to go, dear master,' said the grey wolf, "'and it shall be as you will.' And true enough, when he heard the object of Prince Ivan's journey, he galloped even more swiftly than the horse had done, till towards nightfall he came to a standstill behind a thick stone wall. "'On the other side of this wall,' he said, is a terraced garden, and there, in a golden cage, is the magic bird. The garden is empty now, so no one will stay you if you capture her. But if you touch her cage, there will be trouble. Dismounting from the grey wolf's back, Prince Ivan climbed the wall without much difficulty, and quickly seized the magic bird. She fluttered so wildly, however, as he tried to hold her, though without uttering a sound, that he quite forgot the grey wolf's warning and hastened back for the cage. 
As he touched it, the stillness of the garden was broken by the pealing of bells and the clanking of armor, for the cage was connected with the palace courtyard by invisible wires. Before he could escape, Prince Ivan was surrounded by excited soldiers who quickly carried him before the king. "'Are you not ashamed?' the monarch thundered, noting the young man's rich attire, to be caught in my garden like a common thief? Where do you come from, and what is your name? I am the son of a great Tsar, the young prince answered, and they call me Ivan. My father has a very beautiful garden, in which grows a tree of golden apples that is the pride of his heart. Night after night your magic bird rifled this precious fruit, until I all but succeeded in capturing her. She was too quick for me, however, and flew away, leaving one feather in my hand. This feather I took to my father, who admired it greatly, and ever since has longed to possess the magic bird. Tsar Dolmat looked less angry, though he still frowned. If you had come to me, he said, and told me what you wanted, I would have made your father a present of the magic bird. As it is, I feel inclined to let all nations know how dishonorably you have acted. Prince Ivan bowed his head in shame, and after a searching glance at him, the Tsar continued his speech. "'You shall go forth free, young prince,' he said, "'if you will do me a service. "'In the realm of Tsar Afron, beyond the thrice-ninth kingdom, "'there is a gold-maned horse which belongs to him, and this I greatly covet. "'If you will procure it and bring it here to me, "'I will forgive your theft of the magic bird, "'and present her to you as a mark of honor." Prince Ivan promised to do his best, but he did not feel very hopeful as he rejoined the Grey Wolf, who was patiently waiting for him outside the wall. When Ivan had confessed the reason that led to his capture, the Grey Wolf patted his shoulder with one rough paw. "'It takes a wise man,' he remarked, "'to own himself in the wrong, so we will say no more about it. Jump on my back again, and I will take you to the far-famed realm of Tsar Afron, beyond the thrice-ninth kingdom.' The gray wolf ran so swiftly that Ivan could scarcely see the country through which they passed, and after traveling for many nights and days, they reached at last their journey's end. The marble stables of the Tsar shone fair and stately in the morning light, and through a door which a careless groom had left half open, Prince Ivan made his way. The horse with the golden mane was feeding on the yellow pollen collected by the bees from the tall white lilies that edged the rose garden, and stared at Prince Ivan haughtily as he approached. Firmly grasping his golden mane, Prince Ivan let him out of the stall. The gray wolf had cautioned him more than once not to attempt to bring the golden bridle that hung above the door, but as he was leaving the stable the prince suddenly thought how useful this would be, and turning back stretched out his hand and touched it. Immediately he did so, Bells pealed all over the palace, for, like the cage of the magic bird, the bridle was fastened to invisible wires. The stable guards came hurrying in, full of alarm, and when they saw Prince Ivan they seized him angrily and took him before their master. Tsar Afron was even more indignant than Tsar Dolmat had been at the prince's attempt to rob him. When he questioned him as to his birth and station, his face became sterner still. "'Is this the deed of a gallant knight?' he asked with withering scorn. "'I have a great regard for your father's name, "'and if you had come to me openly and in good faith, "'I would have gladly given you my gold-maned horse. "'But now all nations shall know of your dishonor, "'for such acts as yours must not go unpunished.' "'This was more than Prince Ivan could bear, "'and with eager haste he protested his willingness "'to atone for his fault. "'Very well, then,' said Tsar Afron, I will take you at your word. Go forth and bring me Queen Helen the Beautiful, whom I have long loved with all my heart and soul. I have seen a picture of her in my seer's white crystal, and she is more fair to look upon than any other maid. I cannot reach her, try as I may, since her kingdom is guarded by elves and goblins. If you can capture her for me and bring her here, in return I will give you anything you ask. Prince Ivan hurried away to the Grey Wolf fearing that since he had disregarded his advice for a second time, he might refuse to help him in this new enterprise. Once more he humbly confessed that he had been at fault, and once more the gray wolf consoled him. 
"'One must buy wit,' he growled. "'Well, jump on my back, and I will see what I can do for you.' Then he ran so swiftly that it seemed as though his feet were winged, and the elves and goblins that guarded the kingdom of Helen the Beautiful scattered before him in all directions, thinking him to be a spectre. When he came to the golden streamlet that bordered the queen's magic garden, he told Prince Ivan that he must now dismount. "'Go back by the road we came,' he commanded. "'And wait for me in the shade of that spreading oak tree we passed just now.' Prince Ivan did as he was told, and the grey wolf crouched under a bush of juniper and waited until evening fell. As the light faded out of the sunset sky, and the pale little moon rose slowly over the mountain tops. Queen Helen walked in her garden. She was so fair and sweet to look upon that even the heart of the gray wolf was moved to admiration, and he wished her a worthier mate than the stern Tsar Afron, who knew not how to be gentle even in his love. After a while she approached the streamlet, winding round her dainty threat a cloud of milk-white gossamer, that she might not feel the touch of the evening breeze. "'Do not fear, sweet lady, I will not harm you,' the grey wolf cried as he sprang from his hiding place and crossed the stream. Holding her tenderly by her flowing draperies, he leapt back to the other side and galloped with her to the prince who waited under the spreading oak. When queen and prince beheld each other, it was as if a veil had fallen from their eyes. Never had the world appeared so beautiful, and as they gazed at each other in the soft twilight the queen's fears fled. As for Prince Ivan, he knew from that moment that she was intended for his wife, and when they rode away together on the grey wolf's back he already felt she belonged to him. The journey was all too short, and soon Tsar Afron's palace loomed before them. "'Why are you weeping?' the grey wolf inquired as their tears splashed on his head. Queen Helen could make no answer, but Prince Ivan's words poured forth like a raging flood. "'How can we help it, Grey Wolf?' he cried. "'Since we love each other, and I must resign my beautiful queen to the stern Tsar Afron, or else be branded before all nations as a robber and a thief.' "'I have kept my promise, Prince Ivan,' said the Grey Wolf, "'and served you well, but I will do more for you still. "'By means of magic known to myself alone, "'I, the Grey Wolf, will take the form of beautiful Queen Helen. "'You shall leave the real queen here.' in the shade of this grove of pine trees, and when you have taken Tsar Afron his strange wolf bride, who will appear to him as a lovely woman with golden hair, he will give you the gold maned horse. Bid him farewell as quickly as you can, and taking your queen behind you, ride swiftly towards the west. When I have given you time to journey far, I will ask Tsar Afron to let me walk with my maidens in the woods. Then, if you call me to your mind, I shall disappear from their midst even as they watch me, and join you and your queen." Prince Ivan once more did as the grey wolf said, and great was the delight of the Tsar Afron as he beheld the tall and gracious woman whom the prince presented to him. She was even more beautiful than he had imagined from her picture, and he would have given not only his gold-maned horse but his crown as well to her captor had he desired it. Prince Ivan, however, asked nothing but the gold-maned horse, and was soon speeding across the plains with the real Queen Helen nestling against his side. He rode towards the west, where lay the kingdom of Tsar Dolmat. Tsar Afron was more than content with his wolfish bride, who was not alarmed by his fierce caresses, and only smiled when he threatened to kill her if her love for him should waver for a single instant. On the fourth day after the marriage feast, she complained of feeling stifled in the royal palace. "'If I might walk in the meadows,' she said, "'the breath of the cool fresh wind would refresh my spirit, "'and I could once more laugh with my lord.' So the Tsar allowed her to walk with her maidens. Just at this time the thought of the grey wolf flashed into Prince Ivan's head. "'I had forgotten him,' he exclaimed remorsefully to his dear wife. "'What is he doing, I wonder? I wish we had him here.' He had no sooner spoken than there came a clap of thunder from the distant hills, and the grey wolf suddenly appeared. "'You must let the queen ride the gold-maned horse alone,' he told the prince, "'and I will be your steed.' 
Somewhat reluctantly, the prince accepted his suggestion, and in this manner they rode to the verge of Tsar Dolmat's capital. The kindly looks of the gray wolf emboldened the prince to ask him another favor. Since you can change yourself into a beautiful woman, and then back again into a gray wolf, could you not become for a time a gold-maned horse, so that I might give you to Tsar Dolmat and keep the real one for my dear queen? The gray wolf readily assented and striking his right paw three times in succession on a patch of bare earth, became the exact image of the gold-maned horse who bore the fair Queen Helen, leaving the real horse with his bride in a flower-strewn meadow outside the city. Prince Ivan rode on to the Tsar. He was greeted by that monarch with every sign of joy, for the mane of the gray wolf-horse shone in the sunshine like purest gold. The Tsar kissed Prince Ivan on either cheek, and leading him to his palace gave him a royal feast. For three whole days they reveled in the choicest wines and the richest viands the kingdom could supply, and on the third Tsar Dolmat rewarded the prince with many thanks and the gift of the magic bird in her golden cage. Prince Ivan felt now that his quest was over, and quickly regaining Queen Helen's side, he fastened the cage of the magic bird round the neck of the gold-maned horse, and rode with her towards his father's kingdom. Early the next afternoon they were joined by the gray wolf. Tsar Dolmat had ridden his newly acquired treasure in an open field, and had been heavily thrown for his pains by the false horse, which had then galloped away. As the gray wolf had been so good a friend to him, Prince Ivan could not refuse his request when he asked to be allowed to carry him, so once more the queen alone sat on the gold-maned horse. Thus they rode on, until they came to the place where the gray wolf had slain the horse which Prince Ivan had brought from his father's stable. Here the strange creature came to a sudden stop. "'I have done all that I said, and more,' he told the prince. "'Now I am your servant no longer. Farewell.' And he galloped back to the gloomy wood from which he had first come. Prince Ivan's sorrow at parting with him was very real, but in the pleasure afforded by the queen's company he soon forgot his loss. When he came within sight of his father's realm he stopped by the shade of a belt of fir-trees, and placing the cage of the magic bird and the golden bridle beneath their shade, he lifted down his beautiful queen and rested with her on a bank of fern. They were weary after their long journey, and soon, talking together softly as ring-doves coo in their nests, both fell asleep. Now Prince Dmitri and Prince Vasily had fared badly on their travels, and were returning to the palace empty-handed and sadly out of temper, when they caught sight of the reclining forms of the two sleepers, with the gold-maned horse browsing close beside them. As they stared in amazement, an evil spirit of envy took possession of them, and there presently entered into their minds the thought of killing their brother. Each looked at the other, and then Prince Dmitri drew his sword, and ran it through Prince Ivan as he slept. He died without a murmur, and when the queen awoke she found him lifeless. "'What is this you have done?' she sobbed to the guilty princes. "'If you had met him in a fair fight and slain him thus, he might at least have struck a blow in self-defense, but you are cowards and dastards, fit only for raven's food.' In vain she wept and protested, as the princes drew lots for their dead brother's possessions. The queen fell to the keeping of Prince Vasily, and the gold-maned horse was adjudged to Prince Dmitri. In a passion of tears the queen hid her face in her golden hair, as her would-be lord spoke roughly to her. "'You are in our power, fair Helen,' he said. "'We shall tell our father that it was we who found you, the magic bird, and the gold-maned horse. If you deny our words we will instantly put you to death, so look to it that you hold your tongue and keep our counsel.' The poor queen was so terrified by his cruel threat that speech forsook her, and when they arrived at the palace she was mute as some marble statue, and could not contradict the wicked statements which she heard them boldly utter. Prince Ivan lay dead with his face to the sky, but the wood elves guarded his body, so that neither beast nor bird came near to devour it until the end of thirty days. Then, as the sun was sinking, a raven, seeking food for her young, hopped on his breast, and would have pecked at his eyes, had not the gray wolf galloped up in the nick of time. 
he knew at once that the dead man must be Ivan, and pouncing upon one of the young birds, would have torn it asunder in his rage. "'Do not touch my little birdling, fierce grey wolf,' entreated the mother piteously. "'It has done you no harm, and deserves no ill from you.' "'Then listen,' the grey wolf replied. "'I will spare the life of your birdling if you will fly away beyond the thrice nine lands, and bring me back the water of death and the water of life from the crystal stream whence they flow to the great forever.' "'I will do what you wish,' cried the raven. "'Only do not touch my little son.' And as she spoke, she sped away. Three days and three nights had passed before she returned to the grey wolf, carrying two small vials. One held the water of life, the other the water of death. And as the grey wolf took them from her, he gave a cry of triumph. With a snap of his teeth he bit the young raven in two, tearing it to pieces before its mother's frantic eyes. This done, he broke one of the vials, and when he had sprinkled three drops of the water of death on the slain birdling, immediately its torn body grew together again. Then he touched it with a few drops from the second vial, and the little thing spread its wings, and flew off, rejoicing. Thus the grey wolf knew that the raven had served him well, and he poured what was left of the waters of life and death over the body of the dead prince. In a few moments life came back to him, and stumbling to his feet he smiled at the grey wolf. "'Have I slept long?' he asked dreamily. "'You would have slept forever had it not been for me,' was the reply. And the prince listened with grieved surprise, as the grey wolf told him all that had happened. "'Your brother is going to marry your bride to-day,' he ended by saying. "'We must hasten to the palace with all possible speed. Mount on my back, and I will carry you once more.' So they galloped to the palace of the old Tsar, and the grey wolf bade Prince Ivan farewell for the last time as he dismounted at the great gates. The prince hurried into the banquet hall, and there, looking like some fair statue that had been moulded from frozen snow, sat beautiful Queen Helen by Prince Vasily's side. They had just returned from the wedding ceremony, and all the nobles were gathered round. When Queen Helen saw who had entered the hall, her speech came back to her, and she flew to her lover with a cry of rapture and kissed him on the lips. "'This is my own dear husband,' she cried. "'I belong to him and not to the wicked prince I have married today." From the shelter of Ivan's breast she told the Tsar all that had happened, and how it was to his youngest son that he owed the gold-maned horse and the magic bird. The joy of the Tsar at his favorite son's return was tempered by his grief and amazement at the conduct of the elder princes. They were cast into prison where they languish still, but Prince Ivan and the beautiful Queen Helen are as happy as the days are long, and the magic bird was allowed to return to her home in the Golden West. End of chapter 11《Red by Kalinda》in Lüneburg, Germany, on February 7, 2009. Chapter 12 of Folk Tales from Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask Chapter 12 A Slice of Tongue An Arabian Story Which Suggests the Merchant of Venice Omer was a lazy fellow. There could be no doubt of this, since year after year he refused to bestir himself and still lived on with his parents. His sunny temper and pleasant ways made them forget his many faults, and though his father often reproached him for not making a home for himself as other young men were doing, he only laughed good-humouredly and kissed his mother. "'Why should I make a home for myself?' he asked, "'when I am far happier here than I could be elsewhere.' His mother smiled, well satisfied, for her handsome boy was the very apple of her eye. The years went on, and the time came when the two old folks slept calmly side by side beneath the grass. Omer was left alone, and for the first time in his life he knew what it was to be really miserable. His honest grief became him so well that everyone was sorry for him, 
and many a neighbor offered him bite and sup, and strove to comfort him with homely sayings. It was late now for Omer to remember his father's advice, but still he did so. The first step to take, it seemed to him, was to get married, and accordingly, when the violence of his grief had somewhat worn off, he considered the various maidens in the village. There was Rosalie, who sang like a bird, and Greta, who danced divinely, and was so fair of face that the roses in her window blushed with envy. Neither Rosalie nor Greta, however, particularly attracted him, and his fancy fell on Fatima, who was somewhat shy, and of a beauty less pronounced than that of her rivals. But Fatima's eyes were the very color of his dear mother's, and he fancied he saw in them the same sweet gleam of affection that had made his home a haven of joy. Fatima, for her part, had long loved him in secret, but she wisely determined not to accept his suit until he could provide for her. "'It is time you began to work, dear Omer,' she said, repeating his father's words. "'I will gladly be your wife when you can bring me thirty purses of gold, but not before. We cannot live on air, and it would not be fitting that your wife should work for you.' Poor Omer shrugged his shoulders. What was he to do? His well-shaped hands had learnt no craft, and without capital it was impossible to start a business. In his perplexity he thought of a rich Jew who often made loans to worthy tradesmen who found themselves in difficulties, and accordingly he repaired to this good man. Issachar eyed him shrewdly. "'You say you will pay me,' he remarked, "'but when? I know you well, young Omer.' You are your father's son, but he was industrious, and you are idle. How can I be certain that you intend to work? Omer assured him that once he was married to Fatima, he would leave no stone unturned to win a fortune. Lend me those thirty purses of gold, he urged, and you shall see. The Jew had no love for him in his heart, since he himself had looked upon Fatima with envious eyes, but at last he agreed to advance the money. "'Before I do so,' he said, "'you must sign this.' And he laid before him a document to the effect that, if he, Omer, did not repay Issachar the thirty purses of gold within seven years, the Jew should cut off a slice of his tongue to the weight of a drachm. Light-hearted Omer signed the bond without the least demur. With Fatima for his wife, he thought to himself joyfully, he could do anything— and long before the seven years were expired would be in a position to repay twice thirty purses of gold. He set about his arrangements for the wedding in the highest of spirits, and spent so much in Fatima's honor that before he knew what he was doing, half the money the Jew had lent him had disappeared. Never mind, he thought to himself, I shall soon make more. When the honeymoon was over, he opened a shop for such necessities as brooms, tobacco, salt, and cheese, since he knew that whatever his neighbors could do without, they must have these. Greatly to everyone's surprise, for Omer's laziness was proverbial, the shop did well. Fatima loved her husband dearly, and though she found it impossible to keep him up to her own high standard of industry, she managed to induce him to give the shop at least a certain amount of attention, and when he slunk off to lie on his back in some green meadow, and look at the sky, and dream great dreams, she took his place, and proved so willing and accommodating a saleswoman that customers often chose the hour for shopping when they knew that Omer would be away. In the long knitted purse hidden under her mattress was a shining store of silver pieces, and but for Omer's extravagance there would have been many more. It was well for the little household that Fatima was so clever a manager. Towards the end of the seventh year bad times came to the village, and no one had any money to spend. With a sudden shock, Omer realized that it would be impossible for him to pay back Issachar, and the thought plunged him into the deepest gloom. He could not sleep for thinking what it would feel like to have a slice cut off his tongue, and hearing him sigh so frequently, Fatima insisted on his telling her what was wrong. "'If I had only known!' she cried. How you obtained those thirty purses of gold, I would never have allowed you to touch them. This was all that she said by way of reproach, and Omer had never loved her more than he did in the dark days that followed, 
when both went silently about their work, with down-bent heads and somber eyes. One evening at sunset, Fatima thought of a plan. Dividing her poor little savings into three portions, she wrapped one of these in a silken square and called at the Cadi's house. Making a deep obeisance, she laid the money at his feet and left without a word. This she did on the second and the third night also, and as she was leaving for the last time, the Cadi stopped her. "'What would you have of me?' he asked her kindly. "'O oh, Cadi,' she responded, "'grant me but this one boon. Let me just for an hour sit in your robes on the judgment seat on Friday, and I will bless you for the rest of my life.' The caddy would have refused outright, but Fatima was still a handsome woman, and the beautiful eyes that were raised to his so pleadingly were soft as velvet. "'It shall be as you wish,' he said at last, "'but I shall stand behind the screen and listen to all you say. If during that hour your judgments are not just ones, I shall reverse them, and turn you out of the court as an impostor. Fatima thanked him with all her heart and the following Friday saw her adorned in the caddy's robes, and sitting in his place. The first case to be brought forward was that of Issachar and Omer. The shrunken face of the Jew was alight with malicious triumph. Now at last he would be avenged for the slight that the fair Fatima had put upon him in days gone by. Grinning with delight, he listened to Omer's confession that he could not produce the gold, and hastened to demand that he should pay the penalty. "'You say well,' said Fatima. "'He cannot pay you, and you are therefore entitled to a slice of his tongue. "'Have you a razor, Issachar?' "'The Jew produced one eagerly, and Omer's brow grew pale as death, "'as he saw him feeling the sharp edge and noted his fiendish glee. "'He bore himself bravely, nevertheless, "'and Fatima felt proud of her husband as he quietly advanced to await the Jew's pleasure. "'Be careful,' she cautioned Issachar, that you do not draw a drop of blood, for this the bond does not entitle you to do. If you cut off either more or less than one single drachm, you will be punished with the utmost rigor of the law. It was now for Issachar to turn pale and tremble. There was such decision in the caddy's voice that he knew it would be useless to appeal, and making a great show of magnanimity, he declared that in consideration of kindness shown to him by Omer's father in the past, he would forgive the debt of his son. "'The matter cannot end in this way,' replied the caddy sternly. "'You must keep to the bond. Cut off immediately one drachm of Omer's tongue, neither more nor less.' Issachar, now thoroughly alarmed and fearful of his own life, fell on his knees, and offered a ransom of thirty purses of gold that he might go free without attempting so impossible a task. As the caddy still preserved a significant silence, he added that he would make no further claim upon Omer for the debt he had incurred. "'It is well,' said the caddy, and this declaration was promptly entered in the books. The true caddy was greatly amused at Fatima's stratagem, and refused to touch the thirty purses of gold that Issachar had paid into the court. "'They are yours, O wise woman,' he said with a gracious smile, and Fatima hastened home in her own attire. Shortly afterwards her husband appeared, looking very subdued after the ordeal through which he had passed, and eager to tell her what happened. He lost no time in describing the scene in court. "'That caddy is not only a clever judge,' he said, "'but a handsome fellow to boot.' You should have seen the way that his eyes sparkled when Issachar paid him the gold. "'Was he as handsome as I am?' laughed Fatima softly, and to Omer's amazement she showed him the thirty purses forfeited by his enemy. He wept with joy when he heard how she had saved him by her woman's wit, and from that day forward he became so industrious that fathers held him up as an example to their sons. End of chapter 12 Read by Kalinda, in Lüneburg, Germany, February 7th, 2009. Chapter 13 of Folk Tales from Many Lands This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask Chapter 14 St. Christopher A Roman Catholic Legend There was once a man named Ofero, so tall and strong that he stood among his fellows as a sturdy oak in a grove of saplings. His eyes were keen and clear as some great eagle's, his lips spoke nothing but gentle words, and his heart was as pure and tender as a little child's. His spirit was brave and fearless, and while he was yet in the prime of his strength, he resolved to devote it to some good purpose. "'My friends,' he said, when he had called together his companions, I must leave you now, for something within me whispers that I was born to serve a king so great that fear is unknown to him, a king to whom all men bow. Then he strode away into the forest, and was seen of them no more. For many a day he traversed valley and mountain, inquiring of all he met who was the greatest king. At last he came to a splendid country where reigned a monarch of high renown. His armies were vast and powerful, and his fleet of warships was like a flock of birds bearing death on their grim brown wings. When he was told that Ophero desired to serve him, he welcomed him gladly, and liked the young man so well that he soon made him his trusted counsellor and friend. It was Ophero's pride to see how all men trembled at his master's frown, and he could not believe that there lived a monarch greater than he. One day, however, when the king was present, a courtier made some remark about the evil one. His majesty's august brow grew pale, and Ophero could have sworn he saw his stern lips quiver. Pained and surprised, he humbly asked the king why he was troubled. "'I am afraid of the devil,' said that monarch, "'although I fear no mortal man. He is the king of Hades, and more powerful even than I.' "'Then I must leave you, O king,' cried Ophero with haste, "'since I have vowed to serve none other than the most powerful monarch in existence.' And sorrowfully he turned away. "'Where is the devil?' he asked the first man he met. "'He is everywhere,' returned the traveller, looking round uneasily. And this was the usual answer that Ophero received to his inquiry. Wherever he went, men looked uneasy at the devil's name but would not say where Ophero was most likely to meet with him. He found him at last among a group of idle men and maidens on the village green, and hailed him as his master. The devil was glad to have so strong a follower, and amused himself by showing the astonished giant his power over rich and poor. There seemed to be no limit to his might. He swayed the nobles in their velvet robes, and the peasants in their tattered garments. He is indeed master of the world, sighed Ophero, and though he liked not the devil's ways, he stifled his distaste that he might keep his word. One day his master led him through the outskirts of the town into the open country. We are going to visit a hermit, he said with a burst of laughter. He has left the town to be quit of me, but he will find me in his cave. Before Ophero could ask him what he meant to do with the good hermit, they came to a turn where four roads met. A rough wind swayed the branches of the trees, and a peal of thunder echoed among the lofty hills. It was neither wind nor thunder, however, that made the devil tremble, but the sight of a wooden cross, which some pious folk had erected here. With gaunt arms pointing east and west, it stood immovable. The rain beat down on it mercilessly, as if to cleanse it from the roadside dust and turning his head away that he might not see it, the devil hastened past. Not until it was far behind them had Ophero an opportunity of asking why he had trembled. "'I was afraid,' answered his grim companion, with another shudder. "'Afraid?' repeated Ophero, in puzzled tones. "'Why? What was there to be afraid of?' "'Did you not see the crucifix?' cried the devil impatiently. "'The figure on it is that of the Christ, and that is why I trembled.' The giant had never heard that holy name before, and felt more perplexed than ever as he demanded, "'Who is this Christ whom you so fear?' "'He is the King of Heaven,' was the reluctant reply. "'Is he more powerful then than you?' persisted a pharaoh, planting himself in the centre of the pathway, so that his master could not pass on. 
"'He is more powerful even than I,' admitted the devil, his eyes becoming points of fire. "'Then I shall serve him, and him only,' the giant cried, and turning on his heel he left the devil to go on his way alone. When a pharaoh reached the cross once more, a man was kneeling before it in prayer. As he rose from his knees, a pharaoh asked him the way to heaven. I cannot tell you, said the man, the way is long and hard to find. Tis well that Christ is merciful. A pharaoh met with like answers from many wayfarers whom he questioned, but at last came one who advised him to consult the hermit. He is a holy man, he assured him earnestly, and has retired from the world that he may give his time to prayer and fasting. He thinks he can serve Christ this way better than any other. So a pharaoh sought the hermit, and learned from him many things. He heard of the grandeur and goodness of Christ, and the greatness of his kingdom. All that he said made a pharaoh more eager to serve him than ever, and when the hermit explained that no one could enter the heavenly kingdom until he was summoned there by Christ himself, he bowed his head in disappointment. "'How then can I serve this new master,' he said, "'unless I can see him and hear his commands?' "'Do as I do,' replied the hermit. Give up the world, and fast, and pray. If I were to fast, said a pharaoh shrewdly, I should lose my strength, and then, when he called me to work for him, I should be useless. And although the hermit tried to persuade him, he would not stay, but set off again on his journey, determined to find the way to heaven. Presently he met a company of pilgrims. They were dusty and travel-stained, and very footsore, but their faces shone with joy. There were men and women and little children. Some came from distant lands and some from near. But one and all, they were filled with a deep content. "'Who are you, and whence do you travel?' a pharaoh asked them wonderingly. "'We are the servants of Christ,' they answered, "'and we are marching towards heaven. The path is rough, and the way is long, but his many mansions await us. "'I will come with you and be his servant too,' said a pharaoh, and they welcomed him gladly. The way was long, as they had said. But to the giant the days passed quickly. He was learning so much that he could scarcely sleep for the wonder of it, and his face also shone with happiness. He grew very grave when he heard of the swift-flowing river that all must cross before they could hope to reach the kingdom of heaven. "'There is no bridge to span it,' said an aged pilgrim, whose tottering limbs were now so feeble that but for Ophero's support they would hardly have borne him along." The trembling woman, the little child, must cross it alone in the gloom and darkness, for though they call, no friendly boatman appears in sight. When Christ has need of us, his messenger will appear. He is clothed in raiment white as snow, and although his voice is always gentle, it is clearly heard in the rush and roar of the tempest as on a summer's day. At length the pilgrims came to the river bank, and as the giant gazed at the foaming current, and saw the waves dashing against the shore, he marveled greatly at what he had been told. Surely, he thought, no feeble woman or little child could breast its waters and reach the other side. Even as he mused on this, the white-robed messenger called to an ailing girl who was almost too weak to move. Her master had need of her, he said, and in the fair courts of heaven she would be strong again. What joy was hers when she heard his voice! But alas! When she crept to the edge of the bank and saw the river that swept beneath it, her heart grew sick with fear. She quivered and shook from head to foot, and moaned that she dare not venture. An exceeding pity moved a pharaoh to go to her help. "'Do not weep,' he said, "'but trust me.' And taking her tenderly in his arms, he lifted her on to his shoulder and bore her tenderly across. In spite of all his strength, the pitiless current nearly swept him off his feet and he fought with the icy waters as he had fought no mortal foe. The girl tried in vain to thank him as he placed her on the bank in safety. He would not let her speak. "'Tell Christ,' he said, "'that I am his servant, and that until he shall summon me to his side I will help his pilgrims to cross the river of death.' From henceforth this was his work. He had no time to wonder when his own call would come for day and night there arrived at the banks of the river pilgrims from every clime, and since few had courage to face the dark waters alone, he crossed and recrossed it continually. In order that he might always be at hand, he built himself a rough log hut by the waterside, and here he made his home. 
One night, when the waves rolled fiercely, and the wind blew high, a pharaoh laid him down to sleep. Surely, he thought, no one would dare to cross in such a storm. His eyes had scarcely closed, however, when he heard a knocking on the door. "'Who are you?' he cried, as he threw it open. There was no answer, and by the light of his lantern he saw a wistful child on the river bank. He was staring at the rushing waters with piteous dread, but the tone of his voice was clear and firm as he turned and spoke to a pharaoh. "'I must cross to-night,' he said. A pharaoh looked at him with deep compassion. "'Poor child,' he murmured, "'I am glad I heard you. With a tide like this it will be difficult even for me, giant as I am, but you would be swept away.' With gentle hands he placed the boy on his shoulder, and bidding him not to fear, set out for the opposite shore. He had not overestimated the difficulties he had to face. Time after time he was beaten backward, and the icy waters nearly engulfed them both. It took all his strength to bear up against them, and the weight of the child seemed greater than that of the heaviest man he had ever borne. When at last he climbed the steep, high bank, he was bruised as well as breathless, for the hidden rocks had worked him grievous harm. "'Tell Christ,' he panted, and then he saw that the figure beside him was not that of a little child, but of a radiant being of kingly mien, with a crown of glory on his brow. The giant knelt before him, and the vision smiled. "'I am the Christ,' he said, whom thou hast served so long. This night thou hast borne me across the river of death. Thou didst find me a heavy burden, for I bore the sins of the world. Then he named giant of Pharaoh Christopher, meaning he who hath carried Christ, and took him to dwell with him in his heavenly kingdom. End of chapter 13 Read by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on February ninth, two 2009Chapter 14 of Folk Tales from Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask. Chapter 14 The Basket of Flowers. A story from the feudal times, when the lord of the manor had full power over his vassals. John's wedding present from his master was a charming little cottage, close to the great garden of the castle, which he had made so beautiful. Early and late had he toiled over beds and borders, learning the habits of each tree and flower, that he might know how best to grow them, and when he married a charming bride, as fair as one of his own roses, his neighbors declared that he deserved his good fortune. The Count, his master, was a just and kindly man, and fully appreciated his services. As time went on, and a little daughter was born to John and his wife, they felt they had nothing more to ask of heaven, and the child grew up in an atmosphere of love and sunshine until she was five years old. Then trouble came to the straw-thatched cottage, and the young mother was called away. John and his little Marie were left alone and for many a day to come the songs of the birds sounded sad to them instead of sweet. Marie was just as good as her mother had been, and very soon she became the joy and comfort of her father's heart. Day after day she toddled beside him through the castle gardens, watching him at his work with her clear blue eyes, and shaking her sunshiny hair over the flowers she loved. They were her only companions except her father, and she murmured to him the piteous story of how Fidel, her little dog, had eaten the nose of her best doll, or hidden her ball. The ladies at the castle took a great fancy to the pretty little creature, and often, when she was old enough, the countess had her up to the housekeeper's room, that she might learn to embroider, and put dainty stitches in the delicate fabrics court ladies wore. The grand cook, too, became one of her teachers, and Marie was taught how to concoct wonderful dishes out of very little, so that John fared well when he came in from work. At the age of fifteen his little daughter was a clever housekeeper, and it seemed as if the rest of his days were to be passed in peace. Marie had other accomplishments besides cooking and needlework. 
an old woman in the village whom she had befriended showed her how to weave beautiful baskets from the willows by the stream and marie was always inventing fresh patterns and different ways of twisting the pliant twigs so that her baskets might be different from those of any one else when she wanted a new gown or a dainty for her father she would take some of these into the next town where they fetched a very good price the best one of all however she reserved as a birthday present for the young countess whom she had worshipped from her babyhood the birthday of the countess dawned clear and bright Marie was up early, filling her basket with fragrant pinks and delicate lilies, and arranging these with so much skill that her father exclaimed with pride when her work was finished. Holding it very carefully before her, she shyly approached the castle, and was shown upstairs to her ladyship's own apartments. The young countess was delighted with the tasteful gift, and leaving Marie in her bedroom, flew off to show it to her mother. Hastening back, she thanked Marie once more, and added graciously, it is your birthday, too, dear girl, and this is my present to you. You must always think of me when you wear it. As she spoke, she displayed a simple white robe which she had lately purchased. It was trimmed with pale blue ribbons, and Marie flushed with delight as she curtsied and withdrew. Once outside the castle, she ran so quickly with her treasure that she was out of breath when she reached the cottage. "'Isn't it beautiful, father?' she cried. "'And shall I not look fine in it next Sunday?' All the while they were at breakfast she could talk of nothing else, and her father rejoiced to see her pleasure. He was just going back to his work, when the young countess herself came to the door. She was pale and trembling, and her beautiful eyes were filled with reproach as she flung the flower-filled basket on the floor. "'Oh, Marie!' she cried. "'How could you do it? Is this the way you repay my kindness? Give me back my mother's diamond ring at once, and I will forgive you, but you must never come near me again!' In vain Marie protested that she had seen no ring, and that if she had she would have died rather than steal it. The Countess did not believe her. "'It was there on my dressing-table when I left you in my room, that I might show my mother your basket,' she said indignantly. "'Our maid Henrietta noticed it there the moment before you came in, and no one entered afterwards but you and myself.' "'I never saw it,' repeated Marie. "'Do believe me, dear Countess, I would not rob you for anything in the world.' Her father, deeply agitated, joined his pleading to hers. The young countess turned haughtily away. "'If you will not confess,' she said, "'I shall send you to prison.' And she swept away in a bitter anger. Marie and her father were overwhelmed with grief. He did not for one moment doubt her innocence, but he saw that circumstances were against her, and, dazed and bewildered, knew not what to do. The bailiff shortly afterwards appeared and in spite of Marie's protestations, carried her off to prison. Marie spent a terrible night, and when morning came was but a wreck of the bright young girl who had taken the young countess that ill-fated basket of flowers. Her honest face, as she denied all knowledge of the ring, prepossessed the judge in her favor, but the maid Henrietta was so emphatic in saying that she had actually seen it on the dressing-table before Marie entered the room, and had even noticed how the sunlight caused it to sparkle, that he had no choice but to find her guilty. Marie was sentenced to imprisonment, but the Count, in compassion for her father's distress, begged the judge to modify her punishment. She was accordingly set at liberty, but on condition that she should immediately leave that part of the country, and that her father should pay the value of the ring. The old gardener would not abandon her, so the little cottage was given up, and all their cherished possessions were sold to defray the cost of the missing ornament. The only thing that Marie retained, and a small, old-fashioned portrait of her mother, was the Countess's basket, which she kept as a memento of that dreadful day. The poor old man was sick with trouble as he and Marie set off on their wanderings. He had worked hard all his life, and now, at the end of his days, it seemed as though this disgrace would kill him. His love for Marie was his only consolation and the heroic fortitude with which she bore herself under this heavy trial made her more dear to him than ever. For days they wandered over the country, sleeping at night in the shelter of a hayrick or under a hedge, with berries and fruit for their only food. Nature was kind to them, for the skies were clear, and the air so soft and balmy that it seemed like a caress. At last, when the old man's strength was all but spent, Marie saw before them a comfortable farmhouse, the porch was covered with roses, and the polished windows almost smiled at her. 
Here, she felt, they might meet with friends, and she was not disappointed. The farmer and his wife were kindly folk, and their hearts were moved to pity at the sight of the forlorn wayfarers who approached their door. They invited them into the red-flagged kitchen, and set before them milk and bread. When the wanderers had refreshed themselves, and were seated on the wide oak settle, their compassionate hosts inquired their history, and on learning of their misfortunes, and of what poor Marie had been accused, their hearts went out to them. "'That is the way with those rich people,' said the old farmer. "'They treat us as though we were dogs, and did not know what honour meant. Fancy serving you in that way, and doubting your daughter's words, when you had worked for them faithfully for so many years. But never mind. You shall make your home with us for the present, and when you are strong again we will see what you can do.' So that night Marie and her father slept under a roof once more, and their prayers were full of gratitude to heaven. The old man soon recovered his wonted health, for the fare at the farm was good and plentiful, and the farmer's wife, who had taken a great fancy to Marie, was kindness itself. She had always longed for a daughter, and now, as she said, it seemed as though Providence had sent one. Her only son was a headstrong youth, but little at home, and up to the present had been no comfort to her. In spite of all that had befallen them, the next three years were happy ones, both for Marie and her father. The old man took as much pride in the garden of their kind friends as he had done in that of the Count. He made it a bower of fragrance, and people came for miles to see his wonderful show of roses. The cuttings from his plants brought the farm a considerable sum, and Marie was so useful about the house that the good wife often wondered how she had done without her before she came. Her baskets brought in quite as much pocket-money as she required. "'If only I could prove my innocence of that dreadful theft,' Marie would sometimes say to herself, as she worked in the long summer evenings, but she stifled her sighs lest they might sadden her father. As age came on him he forgot the past, and living only in the present passed his days in calm content. One morning, when she went to call him, she found him asleep, so fast asleep that she could not wake him. The little portrait of her mother lay in his open hand. In spite of her overwhelming sorrow at being left alone, Marie could only feel glad that his pilgrimage was at an end. This was the beginning of a very troubled time for the farmer and his wife, as well as for Marie herself. The preceding winter had tried the old couple greatly and they felt too feeble now to work the farm by themselves. Their son was a clever fellow, and they knew that if he would only give his mind to his work, he could make the farm pay as well as it had done in years gone by. "'I will give everything over to you, my son,' the farmer said, "'if you will solemnly promise that your mother and I shall be allowed to stay here for the rest of our lives, and that you will provide for us comfortably.' Their son gladly agreed to this, for he was tired of roaming about, and glad to settle down. Marie, of course, was to stay on also. She did the work of two servants, at least, so it was no particular credit to the man that he wished to keep her. While he remained single, things went on smoothly, but he soon took a wife from the village, a handsome and showy girl, who was of a jealous disposition, and knew as little how to keep house as she did how to hold her tongue. They had not been married a month before she fell out with the old people, and refused to allow them to sit either in the kitchen or in the parlour. They were turned out of their big bedroom, being made to sleep in a garret instead, and the food she supplied them with was both scanty and ill-cooked. It is hard to say what they would have done but for Marie, who put up with the young wife's temper with angelic sweetness, that she might still be near the dear old people who had befriended her. Before very long, however, her position became impossible. The young wife grew jealous of her loveliness, and sought by every means in her power to make her life unbearable. The climax came when she accused her of having stolen some linen that had been laid out to bleach in the sun, and had mysteriously disappeared. "'You are at your old tricks,' she said to Marie, for she had heard her story, and the poor girl could have sunk into the earth with shame. "'Alas, I must leave you,' she cried weepingly to the old couple. "'I cannot stay here any longer. If only I could die!' For the first time since she left the castle, Marie gave way to despair. She had nowhere to go, for she was homeless. For a long while she wandered about the fields. When dusk gave place to darkness, she made her way to the little churchyard on the hill, where Sunday after Sunday 
she filled the basket on her father's grave with flowers. Here, under the shade of a cypress, she laid herself down and cried herself to sleep. The moon shone down on the sleeping girl, turning her soft bright hair into a wreath of gold as it caught the light. Out of the darkness of the church porch stole a tall white figure that might have been an angel's. But the face was the face of a woman, and she bent over Marie. "'Do you not recognize me, dear child? I am the young countess whom you used to love, and I have come to ask you to forgive me for my cruel doubts.' Marie was too dazed at first to understand the meaning of her words, but presently, as she sat beside the countess in a stately bedroom of the house where she was staying, she heard with joy that her innocence had been proved. "'Last year I was married,' said the young countess, "'and after our wedding my husband and I went back to the castle, which we left soon after you did. During our visit there was a violent storm, and one of the trees close by the window of the room where I used to sleep was struck by lightning and torn asunder.' A great branch fell to the ground, and out of this dropped a magpie's nest. My younger brothers, who were with us, flew to see what it contained, and discovered a number of bright and shining treasures, among which we found that ring. It was clear that the magpie had carried it off, after having flown in through my open window. And you, my poor Marie, were the sufferer. Marie broke into sobs. In the midst of her relief and gladness she could not help thinking of her father and the countess wept also. Presently she went on with her story. My father sent for Henrietta, and forced her to confess that she had actually missed the ring before you came that morning. It was her jealousy of you that made her give false evidence, but I do not believe she has ever been happy since that day. We did all we could to find you, but in spite of our many inquiries we could hear nothing, and thought you must be dead. A few days ago I came to visit a castle in this neighborhood and my hostess brought me to-day to see the little church. As we strolled past the graves, she showed me one which she said was always decked with flowers. It is that of an old gardener, she added. His daughter never forgets him. And there, full of lilies and roses, I saw the basket that you had made for me. I knew it at once, for no one but you ever made them just that shape. I came back to-night because I could not sleep for thinking of the injustice that I had done you. Oh, my dear child, how sorry I am, and what you must have suffered! But that is over now. You must come home with me and never leave me again. Marie did not forget the old couple, who had been so good to her in her hour of need, and the first thing she did next day was to take the countess to see them. Owing to her good offices, the son and his wife were given another farm, and the old people were reinstated as master and mistress of their own home, with a kind young woman to look after them. Marie returned to the castle with the countess, and the people of the village could not do enough to show their contrition for their want of faith in her in days gone by. A few years later she was happily married to a young gardener in the count's service, and went to live with him in the dear little cottage where she was born. The countess gave it to her as a wedding present, and here she and her husband spent many happy years with their children round them. End of chapter 14、Chapter、fifteen of folk tales from many lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kalinda. Folk tales from many lands by Lillian Gask. Chapter fifteen, the monk and the bird of paradise. A familiar legend in Sweden, Austria, and Germany. On the banks of the Rhine stood a large monastery where dwelt a company of monks. These holy men were not only distinguished for sanctity, but also for their wisdom and learning, and one of the foremost was Brother Bernard, whom all reverenced for his piety. From far and near students came to consult him, and his words were quoted as if he were an oracle. In spite of his holiness, however, Brother Bernard had serious misgivings as to the state of his own soul. He could not imagine himself living in paradise for ever without becoming weary of it. Alas! he cried, we tire of everything upon this earth, and I fear that even an eternity of bliss would at last become monotonous. The vesper hymn is very sweet, but I should not care for it unceasingly. 
he was so tormented by this thought that he could neither read nor pray. At the foot of the mountain on which the monastery was built stood a great forest, and here he wandered for hours in the shade of the giant trees, so absorbed in his reflections that he paid no heed to where he trod. At last he prayed that God would work some miracle, that he might know that life in heaven would neither be dull nor dreary. After a while he grew fatigued by his long ramble, and looked around to see whence he had come. To his surprise he found himself in an unknown part of the forest, and on reaching a clearing where the sunlight streamed on the fallen needles of the pines, he threw himself into the midst of their fragrance to rest a while. Just then a little bird, with plumage the color of the sky itself, alighted on the branch above him and began to sing. So pure and exquisite were its notes that Brother Bernard listened in ecstasy until the sweet song ceased. As the bird vanished, the monk rose from his seat. "'Dear me!' he cried. "'How stiff I am! I must have walked much further than I thought!' In stooping to brush the pine needles from his robe, he noticed that his beard was snowy white, and that his hands were wrinkled like those of an old man. Even the forest itself looked changed to him, for the trees were larger, and the bushes had disappeared. He wondered if he could be dreaming, for otherwise, he thought, his senses must be deceiving him. With great difficulty he found his way back to the village, where he was surprised to meet unfamiliar faces. He rubbed his eyes again and again, feeling greatly disturbed. "'I thought that I knew every one,' he muttered to himself. "'But here are people whom I never met before. Who are they, and why do they stare at me as if I were some wild man of the woods, instead of hastening to kiss my hand and receive my benediction?' He was too weary to question them, however, and made his way to the monastery. His astonishment increased when he found a stranger in charge of the gate instead of good brother Antoine, who had held the office for more than fifty years. "'Where is the porter?' he asked him falteringly, "'and what has happened to cause the changes which I see around me?' The brother looked at him curiously. "'I do not know what you mean,' he said, "'for I have been porter here for thirty years, and I can assure you that there have been no changes in my time.' "'Then what can have happened to me?' exclaimed the bewildered monk. "'I went out this morning to walk in the forest, and on my return I find no trace of my old comrades.' Just then two aged monks came slowly by, and Brother Bernard stopped in front of them. "'Do you not recognize me?' he asked. "'Is there no one here who knows Brother Bernard?' "'Brother Bernard?' said the oldest reflectively. "'We have no brother of that name in the monastery now, but I remember having read of him in our chronicles.' He was a most holy man, with the simple faith of a little child. One morning, they say, he quitted the monastery and went to the forest, that he might meditate and pray with nothing between him and the floor of heaven. He never returned, and though a diligent search was made, no trace of him could be found. It was thought that he had been carried up to the skies, like the prophet Elijah, in a chariot of fire, a fitting end to his life of sanctity. "'How long ago was this?' asked Brother Bernard, tremblingly. "'A thousand years,' said the old monk. "'You may see by our books that this is so.' On hearing this, Brother Bernard fell on his knees. "'God heard my prayer and worked a miracle,' he cried, "'that I might have faith. He sent his bird of paradise to sing to me, and while I listened a thousand years passed by. Now indeed I believe, and would fain enter his holy kingdom.' He bowed his head in silence and when they spoke to him again, they found that his spirit had passed away. The smile on his lips was so full of sweetness that the monks marveled greatly, and they noted with awe that his wrinkled face had grown smooth again. "'God is good to his saints,' murmured one monk. "'Amen,' returned the other solemnly. End of chapter 15